welcome back to Tech Travel and Twang. Well, hi, welcome back to Tech Travel and Twang. My co host, Christian Cruz. Hey, Kristen, how are you? Hey, Jen. I'm good. As we're gearing up for the holidays and doing the opposite of what we'll be talking about today, let's talk about wellness before we get super chubbed up on turkey and dressing. <laughs> I love that. I love that. But still, but but I think what's important in that is that we're still planning to do wellness related things. We're not just planning to stuff our faces, right? Like there's other things we're going to do for our mental health. <laughs> It Mental health, a lot of eating, but look, you know, that's what makes us well. <laughs> but I'm really excited as we are, as we've been talking about this for ourselves personally and professionally and just seeing the trends of the travelers, like I'm really, and if we go back and listen to our podcast, we kind of talk about wellness and mental wellness and professional wellness quite a bit. So I'm really yeah. happy to, let's just teeth it in right now before our white paper comes out about our trend predictions for wellness travel. Yes. A lot of, a lot of the industry and a lot of the trends that we're seeing going into 2025 are really predicting, and we're coming off of an election, you know, so this is extremely top of mind for us. It has been, we talked about that in our Mm -hmm. last podcast, but the predictions are are absolutely that wellness and your mental well-being is an absolute focus for you when you're traveling, no matter how long you're going, no matter where you're going, no matter how long you plan to be there. Um, there are, there's so many things under the wellness category that touch how travelers are planning their trips and just what's important. And even outside of just where we talk, we're talking, we talk a lot about Mm -hmm. trends for the leisure traveler, but we're hitting and talking about planners, planning conventions and meetings and what's meaningful to them and their attendees. And we're talking about, you know, people who work and live and work in this industry. Cause let's be honest, we, we're hard, we're hardworking bunch of people in this tourism industry, (laughs) but what it means for us when we're meeting and brainstorming and understanding it. And so it has been such a top of mind for us. We've been leaning into this a lot in our other topics, but this is the time of year to really, really start talking and leaning into some of the things that are really important. You know, and there's so much conversation around that for a lot of reasons too. travel now, of course, so glad we quit saying the words pre pandemic, but of course we're hitting Mm -hmm. records again in travel that's leisure travel, that's business travel and so forth. With that comes outside of anything else going on in our society comes the bad part of travel, which is transportation. So already when you're thinking about doing a trip, transportation sucks. The airports suck. The airlines suck. The Ubers suck. The rental cars suck. Like it is stressful to the max. I had a couple of kids in tow, you know, and it becomes a very high. That's all your patience. (laughs) Absolutely. So of course, on the other side, you know, we're ready for not just maybe drinks by the pool and some relaxation, but some actual meaningful rejuvenation from even the transportation trauma we just had. Absolutely. And here's the way that we're thinking about it as a, as an industry, but just thinking about when we talk about wellness, what that ultimately means. So the global wellness Institute distinguishes between two categories of wellness travel, right? There's your primary wellness travel and primary is essentially those that plan a trip with wellness being the motivation for their trip. They're going with that solely in mind. So they're thinking about that's how they're planning it. That's the itinerary. That's really what they're Mm -hmm. focused on. Mm -hmm. There's another part of that, which is secondary um, wellness travel. And that is where wellness is an add-on to a trip. It's the, there are things that you do that resets that mental well-being throughout your trip. You know, you may go do a whole bunch of adventure thing, but you're going to catch me out by the pool later, you know, or, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I may like do one day where I'm really like focused on a whole bunch of stuff I got to get done, but then I might like take a day just at the hotel or at the short-term rental and just, you know, veg out all day. Um, you know, so there's two kind of areas that, we really think about. And when you add up a, a primary and a secondary, that's basically everybody, right? Like you're either planning 
to go and focus on your well-being or your planning to go and do something else where well-being is still a focus, but isn't well-being a focus for the majority of us is kind of a, my, my point, I guess. So this, we're really yeah. talking about a big movement here in the way that we're shaping how we attract these travelers. It is. And I think it's just some of the, the nomenclature and the words that get mixed up when you hear wellness, people think, you know, it has to be yoga retreat somewhere in Bali, you know, with uh, yogis and all of that. And it's just, that is such an old, small way of thinking about it. So wellness may not be the word that it's always used, but I think health right. to mental mm-hmm. health is obviously a big topic of conversation, but you're right. It really covers everybody now, at least from a U.S. travel population audience. You know, we just talked to one of our friends a little earlier. He was talking about the speaker he met from Germany, was it? They said they consider rejuvenation a right. So this is like Mm -hmm. specifically for our domestic travelers. This is we are opening up to a new era of thinking about and using the terminology wellness in our tourism plans. Yeah. And we've said it so many times on this podcast, even. And we've just been focusing on the travel aspect. Like travel is not a luxury. It's a necessity, right? Like people are prioritizing travel. Like it's, you've got to check the box, no matter where you go, where you do. But that's becoming more and more the norm with, with your, with wellness in general, your, Mm -hmm. your your mental well being, your physical well being. it's becoming a priority. It's not just a luxury you know, to be able to go to that spa thing. And it's really, like you said, it's not, you know, it's not checking into the four seasons and doing two days at the spa. That's not what we as a society consider wellness anymore. It really is looking at things that help you recenter and refocus and check your own mental well-being boxes. And I think, I think they're all getting recategorized a lot because so many different people are traveling in very hyper-personalized ways which is mm-hmm. where, you know, this is also not just a check the box here. Okay. I've got a wellness tourism destination because I've checked all these boxes now. Like I just don't think we think like that anymore. And society doesn't think like that anymore. So it's hyper-personalized. So I would say like what you mentioned, like a four seasons go in, you know, you're paying three, 400 bucks for a Manny Petty kind of thing. That's maybe more on a luxury self pampering. We call that bougie travel, maybe, but not necessarily wellness well, this travel. It's a category. Listen, it's a category <laughs> under wellness. You got your bougie travelers. Okay. And that's what they're going to, and, and that cool. does actually bring up another stat. Like the other stat that was really, really, I think, um, impactful from the global wellness Institute is that wellness tourists, those that either factor in it, this is almost everybody, right? Like this is, you know, those that factor wellness as a primary category or a secondary category on their trip spent 41% more than the average traveler in 2022, 41% more. Like it's not, and there's so many things that you can do wellness, right. That don't cost a ton of money. Like when you think about, you know, the outdoor aspect and you think about the natural resources that destinations have and things that you can go and kind of reset spiritually and just absorbing the sun and touching the grass and (laughs) and those types of things that checks those boxes, but may not necessarily cost you like a trip to the spa would cost you, Mm -hmm. but you're still staying longer to enjoy those things. So you're hit, you're checking the more expensive, you know, or spending more on accommodations. You're, you're, you know, you're, you're still consuming food and maybe even better quality food since you're a little more health conscious and wellness is top of mind. You may be willing to spend more for a restaurant that serves higher quality food than you are going through the drive-through, you know, and picking up something that's convenient. Absolutely. So there's so many, oh, there's so many things. Um, But the ways that I think, and like you said, what's super interesting about this whole thing, I think why we are so, there's so many layers to this is just what, yeah, what people consider to be that checking the box for, for wellness thing that mm-hmm. they travel for. There's so many categories and it's so, it's such an evolving thing 
that we don't talk about it the same way we did several years ago. And destinations don't have to talk about it the same way as they did several years ago. It's not just giving a list of services your destination provides that check the wellness box. It's crafting inspiration and and showing travelers the spaces that can check several different types of boxes for your wellness. Your- they can, but I feel like destinations to this point have communicated to only a very salt, small slice of this audience, an audience that is intentionally seeking this specific type of experience. The problem with that, as I say this all the time, you listen to these podcasts, is that's selling a vitamin to people who want to take vitamins, but not everybody mm-hmm. wants to take vitamins. Um, right. You know, and I hate to say the word painkiller, but it really is like, what are you alleviating? We talk about wellness now. We aren't talking about just those who want to go on a yogi retreat and do, you know, big fast and do big physical things. It may just be like you mentioned, I just need to go touch some grass. I just need to do some forest bathing. I just need to mm-hmm. do some sound bathing and get back out of my head from the craziness. I just think it's such a different thing. And I worry that we categorize too too much. Well, I think the idea of a trip, just the general idea of a trip is to go do things, right? Like it's to go experience something. It's to go do something. So when you mentally prepare for a trip, you're mentally prepared to like, go be active, like go do all the things, go experience this place and do a lot of things and be on the go. But over the last couple of years, like Booking trips to intentionally slow down is a thing. Booking trips to go sleep, like a sleep trip, to go sit in your hotel or let me sorry, lay down in your hotel or your rental or wherever it is that you're staying and intentionally slow down. Mm-hmm. That's a thing. You know, that's a, 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 you will spend money to go not do as much. It may be in a whole different place. But that is intentional and it's a different type of trip, I guess, than, you know, than what we typically see destinations promoting or wanting or really thinking they're com- their, their travelers are coming there to do like those I things. Think, may be changing. And I think they would, they would see a tip if the travelers knew there was something like that to do, because people, you know, if you go out on the street and ask 10 people, you know, what a sleepcation is, come on, would figure it out, but it's not like it is such an average word yet it's something that's happening people are doing they're going to sleep and rest but they may not be connecting with that nomenclature Um, but there are very excited about uh, Kristen and I have put together 10 trends we see coming up from a leisure perspective uh, in wellness travel and there's just a couple of them we want to tease on today Kristen what's your fave oh Um, there's so many that are my fave. I think probably the one that I like the most, and I think would be a really interesting conversation is probably, you said forest bathing already, which I know when I heard forest bathing, I was like, Ooh, what do we, how do we, what do we do? Like, what does this mean? Um, so I definitely want to talk about that. Yes. Um, but I also really like the, um, the idea of the rewilding retreats. I, really I thought love that, that one was, that's so interesting to me. So because we become overly digitized and openly, openly urbanized, we've lost some of those primal skills. And at first when I saw it, I was like, is this some prepper stuff? But no, not at all. It's very, it really is with like our rhythms. It's like primal movements it's survival instincts, it's foraging, it's connecting back to the earth out of our very busy urban and digital Mm -hmm. environments. Yeah. And I've seen this actually. Yeah. There's a group that we have locally and I've seen, uh, guys post in there. Like they do like guy trips and it's like, yeah, we're going to go and we're just going to be in the wild and we're going to have a great time. And it's like, so you're going to go pitch a tent and like, find your food in the river. (laughs) I mean, it, but it's a niche, right? For some people like they, they want that experience and they feel like they're going to learn something. And maybe again, like it's intentionally slowing down and focusing on like the, the bare minimum things that you need to survive. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like leaving behind all the things that are just noise that we think we can't live without, but we could, we could absolutely live without. 
Yeah. Um, but I love that one because also I'm a big sucker for, you know, a campfire and immediately I'm like, why don't we just, this is just like Girl Scout camp, Boy Scout camp redone. Like we learned these things. Yes. But that's where I feel like for women, it's more of glamping. Like you and I, we want to like a fire pit, a nice fire. Right. But make it a glamp site. Not don't like maybe not in the middle of the forest with a tent, but maybe some air conditioning. (laughs) We want it for us to look a little different. (laughs) Although I could still start a fire with a couple of sticks and a stone. (laughs) I'm just sure you can. <laughs> I love that one. Okay, so here's one of my faves. The blue mind escapes. Yes. Yes. So this is something we're going to test out together when you're here for our business slash family slash holiday next week is do some of those sound baths on floats on the water. So a blue mind escape is basically getting in that water one way or another connected to water it could be ocean water it could be pool water it could be underwater meditating which I'm very curious how that works like I I don't know that I want to do I would do over the water meditating like put me on a float and let but underwater I'm not sure I'm in the mindset of meditating I am and it depends on what body of water you're putting me in (laughs) there's a couple of resorts popping up I believe can't remember exactly where they are I believe outside of Indonesia maybe anyway and they're just literally pods for blue mind escape so they're like in the middle of the Mm -hmm. ocean and there's Mm -hmm. like this it looks space age too it's like this pole that comes up and then there's like this pod that you can stay in resort wise like yeah I don't know about that I'm still iffy about the resorts that have the glass bottom over just barely like off the shore I could not be out in the middle of the ocean I feel like that's definitely a niche because you do have those with the anxiety. I feel like that probably would not be able to take full advantage, but floating on the top, like a pool, like a salt pool. That's a huge thing. You see a lot of that happening on social media and it's, and it's essentially just as simple as like getting on a float, you know, on top of, you know, in a pool or in a body of water and being able to like put something over your eyes cover your body, stay warm, but just like escape for a minute and feel that mimic that flow of waves in some way, like mimicking water flowing. Maybe that sets something up in your body for a a different type of flow, but that, that would be really interesting. I would love to do that. Absolutely. It's funny you say flow, because I think that brings to the other one we want to kind of hit today, which is your circadian rhythm. And how Mm. circadian travel is becoming part of that. Because both of those we just hit really do hit on something that is very big about listening to your body and being more primal and more connected. But, you know, it's kind of a a, a buzz term for those recovering from jet lag. But Kristen and I see so many more applications to just getting in touch with your rhythm, you know, Um, getting in touch with your personal rhythm, being able to, that's why sunshine is so important to us, why we get depressed in the winter, sleep when you need to sleep, eat when you need to eat, not just because there's a, you know, a mm-hmm. clock that tells you to do so. Yeah. Cause we, you have your normal clock, but you also have that internal clock, which you have to be mindful of, you know, and we all know over the past few years, there's been so much more technology and so much more study into the light systems that our bodies Mm -hmm. respond to red light, blue light, all these different lights, um, therapies that are, that do different things in our bodies. And so it's extremely important, especially when you're, you know, once it, well, if you're traveling quite a bit, if you're doing a lot of international traveling, or if you're, um, you know, doing a lot of commuting, um, you know, via plane for whatever reason, a lot of work travel, but it's also, I think really important this time of year, Um, when, you know, we have less daylight in general, it gets darker a lot earlier, but we, as you know, we go into a seasonal something and it affects a lot of people. Um, and And there's some, yeah. And there's some chefs, what I like about that too, is there's some chefs that basically offer circadian food too. And food is a medicine, definitely massive trend. You're going to see this more and more in, you know, in tourism and in this wellness movement. 
Oh yeah. It's huge. I think social, just, just social media in general, the past couple of years have really brought to light a lot of the things that we do to our bodies Mm -hmm. that we consume things that we just kind of just weren't top of mind for us that all of a sudden now it's like, wow, I really need to change the way I eat. I really need to like think about food a lot differently and that it is its own medicine is it is the rawest, best form of medicine and can heal so many things in our bodies. But we just, we, we haven't really looked at it like that as much as we do now as a whole human body. Like we think about it so differently, especially I, in the U S such yeah, a big topic. So dialed into that commitment after November 27th. <laughs> <laughs> wait, isn't Thanksgiving, November 28th. Oh, wait, I think it might be. Okay. <laughs> Obviously, my circadian say. rhythm might be a little off right now. So just flow with me. You don't have to edit this. We say off. that, but right after Thanksgiving, you go into, you know, you go into December. That's when the best desserts are available. I mean, that's yeah, Christmas. Care about sugar. It's the best chocolate. See, I'm a sugar person. And so that this is my season. We call this the bulk season. <laughs> where you know we bulk up a little bit but we'll lose it it'll be fine Um, I mean that's that's the food is the medicine you need during that time it's nostalgia it's connecting to family members who aren't here anymore and that oh that brings me to another topic that I wanted to cover is thinking about wellness outside of the activities and the things Mm -hmm. that kind of are meaningful to that but just the habits of wellness travelers and food and cultural experiences is really important. Um, being able to try new things with new people, sample new, you know, recipes, food in terms of like cooking classes and things like that. The, wow. the, the activities of wellness travelers are really dynamic. Like it really, yeah. So what I'm here, you're, what I hear you saying is they're very demure, very mindful. <laughs> <laughs> you could totally tell we have young kids because we're like the, <laughs> we're like the moms that like try to repeat everything we hear to make it make sense. <laughs> I had to slide that one in because if I say it in my house and my kids are home, I'll say, I'll hear, stop saying that. Don't say that ever again. <laughs> I know. And when I tell my kids, are oh, you didn't, you shouldn't have started it. You shouldn't have started it. I don't know. You started it and we're running with it. So anyway, I love yes. this conversation. Cannot wait. Follow along for our white paper to drop somewhere around the holidays because good reading for that part of it. And wellness travel is, I think is going to be just more and more topic of conversation. Uh, right alongside, I would say a double runner to AI this year. Yeah, yeah I would say absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Well, fun chat, Kristen. I guess I'll see you next week. I'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.